So a few weeks after this TEDx session becomes very popular on the internet, and I see no reason why it shouldn't be popular on the internet because of the great talks that we're having right now. Um, some guy in a tier two city in India, by tier two I mean uh, Ranchi, uh, Nagpur, uh, Tirunelveli or Trivandrum, sits in front of a computer to access a video, uh, the, the, te the TEDx talk that we just heard by Mr. Shankar. And he notices, as we all have in the course uh, of surfing the internet and especially viewing YouTube, that there is an advertisement before the actual content begins. And he also notices that, uh, like, like we all have um, while browsing YouTube, that the advertisement for some reason is loading faster than the actual content of the video. We've, we've all had an experience with this. Um, so after, and, and in this case, the advertisement is of an expensive brand of watches promoted by um, an e-commerce site. It could be a Flipkart, a Mintra, a Jabong, whatever. And after viewing this tastefully done ad of a very expensive brand of watches, he then goes on to the actual content where he sees me speaking like this. After three seconds, he, after literally after three seconds, he, he watches the ad through its uh, entirety and he, he closes the video after that and probably decides to do something else. Probably buy that expensive brand of watch. And what's, what, what has happened here to this guy from this tier two city who has a limited bandwidth, his internet connection is not super fast, say as in, in, in a metro, has happened to all of us at one point or uh, other during our time surfing YouTube or any other video content on the internet. And the three second rule that I'm uh, talking about, I didn't make that number up. According to one um, you know, website analytics, uh, an uh, analytics company, three seconds is all it takes for 40% of internet users to abandon that website that they're browsing and go on to another one. Our attention span is so limited that three seconds is all it takes for us to change our mind and say, okay, I'm not going to view uh, Arun today. In fact, I'm going to buy this expensive brand of watches. And it's probably a good decision in hindsight. But at the end of the day, we are here to watch a TEDx session, right? So what has happened here is that the internet, or rather the internet service provider, it could be an Airtel, it could be a Reliance, any company that brings internet through cables to your home, has not been neutral. And this is what I'm going to talk about today, the concept of net neutrality or network neutrality. In this case, the hypothetical example that I've talked about, Flipkart, or the, the e-commerce site in, in, in question, had struck a deal with Airtel or Reliance or whichever company that brought you the internet to say, we will give you a certain amount of money per month, per year, to stream our content faster than the rest which is to facilitate the streaming of our exclusive content on the internet. The, the TEDx talk can you know, stream normally, but this is, remember, a tier two city which has a limited bandwidth. So as a result, we, we end up watching the advertisement more because the internet service provider has not been neutral. Now, why is network neutrality a big thing? I hope I was able to relate in in a very simplistic way as to how network neutrality affects us in our lives as we are on the internet. And the question is, why is it such a big deal? And it's not just a question of, you know, if you're really persistent about watching this TEDx talk, you will wait. You know, you will wait for more than three seconds, you'll probably wait for more than 10 seconds, and you'll watch the entire advertisement as it streams wonderfully well, and then you will watch me speaking like this, but you'll watch the entire content. But in an information age, and this is a term that we often use, um, sometimes misuse, we always claim that we are living in an information age. And what does net neutrality mean to us in an information <coughs> age? First of all, what do we mean by the term information age? We are probably talking about one period in time, this period in time, where information is more accessible to us than any other moment in the history of mankind. But the question is, are we consumers of information, also masters of the information age. Do we decide what information we should be viewing on the internet? Or is somebody else telling us implicitly or expressly as to how we should be viewing 
what content on the internet. And this information <coughs> age, let's not be fooled by anything else, it's been possible entirely on, or, or, you know, because of the telecoms revolution. And the internet is the most visible product of the telecoms revolution. If you are not a master of your information, or rather the information that you are seeking out, then what is being shown to us? What I am going to talk about, or rather what I am talking about in this situation, is how <coughs> companies are striking deals with internet service providers across the world, not just in India, this is a trend that is happening across the world, where internet service providers are not neutral or do not give equal treatment to the content that flows along through their cables or internet pipelines. So if I'm sitting in Taj Malabar, uh, accessing the uh, 3G service from uh, my, spa my smartphone or my tablet, network neutrality means that my Airtel connection or my Reliance connection or my Vodafone connection should stream everything to my 3G service or my, my tablet without discriminating between content. It shouldn't tell me that expensive brands of watches are the most important thing to buy because they stream faster, while a TEDx session is not that important compared to the expensive brand of watches. So the question is, in an information age, are we being walled in by the great websites of our time? You know, there's not a person here, I'm pretty sure there's not a person here who does not have a Facebook account. There are lots of Twitter users in the audience, I'm sure. And pretty much everyone in this, in this room who has a smartphone probably uses WhatsApp as well. Now, how many of, we, uh, you know, how many of us know for a fact that Facebook has um, contractual, legitimate contractual arrangements with internet service providers to provide free Facebook apps, free uh, Facebook packs, free WhatsApp packs where you pay 36 rupees, I think it's 49 in Kochi or 36 rupees in Kochi, where you get free Facebook uh, access, free access um, in, uh, in your 2G or your 3G smartphone um, connection. If the Airtel or the Reliance connection that connects you to the internet is not being neutral simply because it privileges Facebook or Twitter over quote unquote normal uh, co content of a website then we have a whole generation of users, especially in India, because more people as we speak are being connected to the internet in India than in any geographical location in the world. Who are these people interacting with in the internet? Are they connecting, is their primary idea of the internet Facebook? Sure, Facebook is a wonderful site. I mean, it's, it allows for a diversity of opinions, allows us to connect with near and dear folks. But is Facebook, are notion of the internet? Is Twitter our notion of the internet or is WhatsApp our idea of the internet? Especially in tier 2 and tier 3 cities where you may not have a tablet as your primary uh, you know, instrument of connecting to the, to the uh, internet. It would probably be uh, um, a smartphone or, you know, or, or, or just an, a normal phone which has just enough 2G connection for you to access Facebook or Twitter or nothing else. So, it's a very important issue in, in, in that regard. For instance, WhatsApp today has signed deals with Airtel, Uninor, Reliance Mobile, and Tata Docomo to provide free WhatsApp apps. This is exactly you know, what I told you a few minutes back in terms of paying a certain amount of money, which is nominal, 30 or 40 bucks. But you get free WhatsApp um, uh, connections to, you know, your, the time taken in you dealing with WhatsApp on your smartphone would be minimal compared to you, say, accessing certainly not a TEDx video in an entirety on a, uh, on a limited smartphone. And this is an inform and, and this process of breaching what is known as network neutrality or net neutrality <laughs> does not make us uh, the masters of the information that we speak. And I personally believe that if you do not seek out the information that you find in the internet or if you're not a master of the information age, then it's a one-way street. You really can't be branding the internet as the thing that's revolutionizing everything if your primary source of information is Facebook, Twitter, and WhatsApp. And the stats in India are simply staggering. Like I said, you know, at any given point of time, more Indians are getting plugged to the internet than in any other point, any other location in the world. 10 million unique subscribe, uh, 10 million subscriptions um, are being, you know, in, in, the, the number of mobile subscriptions rather in India are increasing by 10 million. However, there are only 319 million um, unique subscri sub mobile subscriptions in a country of 1.2 billion people, 
which is the, the mobile penetration in this country is around 25%, which means there's a long way to go for more Indians to, to buy a smartphone and get plugged into the internet. 50% of the telecom sector is controlled by three companies. The, the, the market for companies like WhatsApp, which incidentally, ha India is the biggest market for WhatsApp, um, with 50 million users, and that's a staggering number. And the market for companies like WhatsApp is $4 billion. So clearly the stakes are high. And companies are striking more deals with internet service providers to say, please promote our content. We are paying you good money. There is no law against it as of, as of now in India. And if you stream our content faster, we'll continue this contractual arrangement. What about those sites or those videos um, that we would like to watch, but are simply not able to watch because our bandwidth is limited? Our connection speeds are not as good as, say, a consumer in the United States or the European Union. What happens to that content? Are we, like I said, being walled in by the great guardians of our time, which really are the tip of the internet iceberg? And so to debate this issue, I mean, because I'm making it sound, I know, that this is something that is really desirable. You know, internet service providers should be neutral while transferring content through their cables. Why is there such a big debate happening in the United States, in the European Union, and other, you know, that in Latin American countries, but not in India? One reason is that we do not have laws and we haven't even thought about it because our internet penetration is so poor that the government at this point of time is trying to lay down internet cables than worry about what goes on to the internet cables. The second reason is that internet service providers are actively resisting this, especially in the United States. In 2007, the Associated Press and the FCC, which is like TRI for us, is the internet regulator, the Federal Communications Commission, found out that Comcast, Comcast is the number two internet service provider in, um, in um, the, in the United States. It found out that Comcast was not only promoting certain content, but also slowing down some content, which is, you know, frankly, egregious because if you are promoting some content because they're paying you money, at least you can say it's a free market, you know, those people who have money to promote their content on our cables will get preferential treatment. But why do you slow down the content, certain content on the internet, so that we are not able to access that information? Now, this is a debate because internet companies believe, or rather internet service providers believe, there has to be some way by which we can return our investment. You know, laying down cables, especially to Fort Kochi or Wellington Island, is a thankless job. You will have to, one, battle it out with the municipality to dig cables. <laughs> then, when uh, you have a cable laid down, you will have to package your internet connection in such a way that it reaches across uh, you know, a person who can just about afford it, a person who can comfortably afford it. And finally, you have to make a return on the investment that you've made because this internet connection, this internet cable that runs probably around Taj Malabar or through Fort Kochi will be there for all time to come. Once you've laid down that cable, how do you make a return on that investment? So companies like Airtel and other, uh, I'm just using Airtel as an example, uh, say that we need to provide, we need to get some money on what we've invested. And therefore, if companies like Facebook or Twitter want uh, to pay money to promote their content, why shouldn't we? So that's the first argument that they make you know, against net neutrality. The second argument is that it provides an incentive for good companies to come out with good applications. Like Facebook is really popular because it's good. I mean, we, we all love Facebook because it's such a user-friendly platform and it allows us, like I said, to connect with people who are near and far. So if you allow applications to be promoted like this, there's an incentive for them too, you know, to come up with better products. These are the two main arguments that are advanced for uh, against net neutrality. While activists who believe that net neutrality must be implemented strictly say the internet is a different entity. It, it, it works on a process of disruptive innovation. In the 90s, you had Yahoo, which was a financial behemoth, which was a huge company, which was you know, which was riding the internet phenomenon at that time, the IT bubble, and it was the main search company that everyone went to. Google was a tiny company. But at that time, the United States had a net neutrality law in place, which meant that AT&T or Comcast or whatever company that laid down the cables should not discriminate between Yahoo and Google. Now we all know today which is the more popular company. I mean, I at least use Google for most of my searches. <laughs> 
is because I feel Google is a better product than Yahoo. At the same, I mean, that, that perception could differ, but ultimately, I have the choice today to decide between two excellent search engines, and that's because of net neutrality. So if you, if you don't allow for this sort of chaotic, disruptive innovation that the internet is famous for, you know, we would not, we would not have had Facebook. I, I don't know how many people here remember Awkward. It was shut down last week, by the way. And Awkward is the first forum that we all went to for social uh, interaction before social media became such a huge thing. And what if some guy at Harvard, sitting in his dormitory, didn't have the wherewithal to provide money to her, uh, to her, his or her internet service provider, saying, "Please promote Facebook at the cost of Awkward." You know, he he didn't have the money. Um, Mark Zuckerberg. But the internet allowed him to innovate, and because Facebook and Awkward were tinted on the same level, irrespective of what your financial strength was, Facebook became a better product. Because ultimately, we are the masters of what we choose in the information age, and we chose Facebook. And in India, of course, there's absolutely no law whatsoever to govern. So whatever has been happening till now is legitimate, because there's no law prohibiting any of this. I don't know how many of you would have read the terms and conditions before signing a Wi-Fi agreement with Airtel. Uh, you know, I, I didn't either, but before the TED talk, I had to do this. So this is the terms and conditions of my Wi-Fi connection back in Delhi with Airtel. And I certainly didn't read all of it. But I did read one paragraph, which was pretty interesting, which said that the broadband speed available to customers is the maximum prescribed speed for which the customer is entitled. And Airtel does not hold out any assurance that the said speed shall be maintained at all times. And the same vary, and the same may vary depending on the network congestion, technical reasons, or any other quote unquote unavoidable circumstances. Now, there are many unavoidable circumstances, including somebody paying you more, which me, you know, makes me, in, 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 which leaves me in an unavoidable circumstance to promote that company. So at the, you know, at the, I just illustrated this, and I'm sure there are similar terms and conditions for any internet service provider in <laughs> India. And I use this to illustrate the fact that we are, at this point of time, going back to the basic fact, not masters of the information age. And in terms of, you know, many of you would have read recently that Reliance took over Network 18. And People were saying, you know, what is going to happen to the future of media because Reliance is such a powerful company. But at the end of the day, Reliance is pretty clear that it's rolling out 4G services. And once 4G services come in, CNN and IBN or Network 18 apps will be available free. So Reliance effectively controls the medium and the message. And that's a problem. So it's time that we started debating about whether the internet is neutral or not because I think we should be caring about whose internet is it anyway. Thanks.